start and we wanted to do something that wouldn't be too committal in the beginning because we're in a new church, we're in a new town, a new state actually, and uh, so um, doing a uh, uh, greeting seemed like a pretty safe place to start. I got involved with the Westport Soup Kitchen, uh, started out doing mission trips around the same time. Uh, we did Holmes Gardens, we go over and pick up the kids from Holmes Gardens, bring them to Warnell for dinner, and, uh, and I have a little boy now that I'm mentoring also, Morion. And, uh, he's seven. A canoe trip with the youth, snow ski thingy, whatever you call it, in North Kansas City with the kids. They have a Believe conference for the middle school, taking them down there three or four times and get to drive the big yellow bus. That's always fun. <laughs> His favorite. <laughs> yeah, my favorite. <laughs> <His> favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would say 10,000 or more miles if I was going to guess, um, but they're all good miles. Jim mentioned um, we did begin as greeters, and that was a great way to introduce ourselves to new people, especially since we were new ourselves. Um, and then um, as we moved over to the, the Warnell location or the South Kansas City location, um, just most recently we became coordinators of the Harvester Monthly Food Distribution. Um, and, and also about two years ago, I became involved with Lee DeReed at the Boone Elementary. Yeah, I started mentoring and tutoring. Um, I don't know exactly when it was. It's, I think around... 14, I don't remember for sure, but anyway, Emil and Lewis were the two boys that I was introduced to by Kim Schwaller. Uh, we had actually been picking them up at Holmes Gardens on the bus when we would bring them on Wednesday. And uh, I get one sat down to work on his schoolwork and the other one's gone. And I get him corralled back and the other one's gone. And you know, for an hour and a half, it was just a battle. <clears throat> I was never so glad to get him home. And uh, when I got done, I called Miss Kim on the phone and I said, you know what, I don't think I can do this. And she says, Jim, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. She was right. I mean, they were uh, five and seven back then. Now they're nine and 11. Um, the only thing that separates us now is because they live in St. Louis. So Marianne and I have made four or five trips to St. Louis to see them. We've seen them on occasion when they come here to visit family. Um, they're part of our family. For us, I think as a couple, it has helped us to grow spiritually um, by attending um, all of the, the events that we've attended. We've definitely become more loving, more compassionate in what we've seen and what we've done. Um, really um, much less judgmental of, of those that we are serving. Well, to encourage people to get involved in ministry, I would just say give it a try. You know, several years ago, Jim West had a, had a uh, sermon and he was saying, uh, get your pen ready at the end of the sermon. I'm gonna give you some points on what to do to serve your community, to get involved and evangelize, and then up on the screen it said, go. That's all it said, just go. And it's really that simple. Um, but yeah, that's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. I agree. I would say find your niche. There's so many opportunities here at Colonial that you can become involved in. If you're new to Colonial or if you've been here for you know 40 years, there are still um, things that can be done and um, opportunities galore that that are really awaiting everyone you just have to find the niche and find your passion and as jim said give it a try good morning church morning. so good to be with you this morning don't you love jim and marianne anderson you guys thank you you know i i, I actually marvel at folks who come to church regularly on Sundays just to hear a message and and keep coming because I, I really don't I don't think that I would personally uh, because you know what the, the key to being part of the body of Christ and really enjoying it and finding great satisfaction in deep relationships is is getting plugged in to serve where you are in a place where you're making these new relationships you're mentoring kids to become part of your family. You're, you're driving that bus and getting to know the names of people and having shared experiences and stories together. And this is really, it's fun. And I hope you saw that. Uh, Jim and Marianne are having fun. Deb Milliken last week, she's having a blast doing her ministry. We talked about this last week, that every single person is created by God. God designed you specifically the way you are for a ministry that he has gifted you to do. And you're just not going to be satisfied. You're going to be restless in your spirit 
in this life until you get connected into that place where you're doing the thing that God made you to do. All right, so we are, as a church, as we're going through this Believe series, we're learning to practice what Jesus practiced. Part of that spiritual discipline of becoming like him is just to serve. And you can do that in a lot of different places. But if you're a part of this church, then you're part of the body of Christ, this local expression of the bride of Christ called Colonial. And so we would love to help you find your niche to get plugged in to where you can be moving from being a greeter, if that's where you start, to just finding what you love to do. Maybe that is what you love to do. Maybe you love to sew or cook or, or tutor, or there's just so many opportunities. So please, as you make your way out today, we have Serve Finders that are a little book where you can just see all the opportunities to get connected. We also have a kind of a new environment we've created called Find Your Niche. Uh, it'll take just a short time, but you'll get a chance to connect with some of our leaders. Pastor Mark will be back there, and they will uh, just spend time with you, helping you get connected and to find your niche. We really hope that you'll take advantage of that. Um, I want to give a shout out to Vera Combs. I see Vera's back visiting today. Hey, Vera. So glad to see you back from <laughs> visiting. Long, long time member of our church. So glad to have her back. It's just a big family reunion when folks come back to visit. So uh, we're, we're, we're looking at these spiritual disciplines. We've talked about worship and prayer and Bible study and single-mindedness, total surrender, living in Christian community, the, the discipline of serving. And today, I'm going to get right into your personal space because we're talking about the stewardship of time, the discipline of surrendering our time uh, in, in, in living our time, living in the rhythms of our time like Jesus did. And so I'm <laughs> going to address this under, predictably, three subheadings. Number one, <laughs> the toxic consequence of a hurried life. Number two, living your life on purpose. And number three, practical next steps for redeeming our calendars. Uh, I want to begin by just acknowledging the irony Okay, and many of you know, I devote one entire day to, to preparing a message. Uh, currently, it's Tuesdays, and so uh, my, my hope and desire on that Tuesday is I get up early, and I start reading. I start just pouring in and allowing the Lord to really fill my mind and heart, and then, you know, by noon, I'm writing, and I write until I'm done, and sometimes that's 5 o'clock, sometimes it's 11 o'clock at night. I never know, but... It needs to get done on Tuesday. I'm kind of obsessive about it. So this Tuesday, uh, I had I could not help. I actually had to come to the office for a an international conference call with our partners in Kenya, and then I ran back home. We had house guests, very dear friends, who've been staying with us for a few days. So we had breakfast together and kind of a long goodbye. And so by the time I actually got started, about 10:30 in the morning, I'm like already stressed out. And I've got about one hour of good study in, and my wife calls. She says, I, you need to take Jonah to this rehearsal because they didn't have school. I don't know why. Uh, and so that was an additional 40 minutes. And I'm like, really? I just got started, so I'm, I'm driving my son, and my best friend calls from Hilton Head, Chris Sanders, and he, you know, we're catching up, and I'm just unloading on him. I'm like, I have no time to prepare my message on the faithful stewardship of time. He just started laughing at me. He's like, you have to start with that. That's like you're, you need to tell the congregation that. And you know what? This is it, like the irony is laughable because this is an issue for all of us. I mean, time is a really big deal. And for a lot of us, our lives are out of control. We, we have so little margin. And I'm going to tell you, if you work and you have kids at home, there's no question about it. We are often stressed and anxious about many things, and Jesus said, be anxious about nothing. We read that, and we're like, well, I'd like to see you give that a try, Jesus. Try, try, try having my four kids, you know. Uh, be anxious about nothing. It, it's tough when it comes to time. And I just want you to know that I am in the boat with you, that this message is not in any way, hey, I've got this figured out, and you should have this figured out by now. I, I think this is something that all of us wrestle with. We struggle with time management. I am no exception to that rule. The problem is that th this, this is no excuse for us to remain stagnant in our kind of manic, no-margin lifestyle. 
if we're becoming like Jesus, and that is the goal of everything that we do in the church, we should become masters of our time and not allow our schedule to become our masters. Amen? And so how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, uh, we have to be convinced of the problem. And I'm going to tell you right now that hurry, hurry is a problem. In fact, there's, did you know there is such a thing called hurry sickness? Hurry sickness. Dr. Meyer Friedman defines hurry sickness this way. He says, above all, it is a continuous struggle and unremitting attempt to accomplish or achieve more and more things or participate in more and more events in less and less time, frequently in the face of opposition, real or imagined, from another person. How do you know if you have hurry sickness? You may have hurry sickness if you just start doing everything faster all the time. You talk really faster. Like when people are talking, you nod faster, and you're constantly trying to tell people, like, get to the point, right? You may have hurry sickness. I, my hurry sickness, uh, <laughs> it shows up when I'm trying to relax and play cards with friends or my family or, you know, play a board game. It takes exactly one one-thousandth of a second for me to say, it's your turn. And then it takes exactly 1.5 seconds for me to repeat it in case you didn't hear me. It's still your turn. Right? You may have hurry sickness. If you find yourselves driving and you're, you see a light and you start counting the cars in the right lane and the cars in the left lane so that if the light should turn yellow, you might be able to sneak through, but God forbid you have to stop. You want to be stopped in a lane that has the least amount of cars. Depending upon the make and model of the car and what you know about people who drive the make and model of those kind of cars. <laughs> the fact that you actually drive this way and think everyone else should is an indicator that you probably have hurry sickness. You may have hurry sickness when you go into the grocery store. And you have a cart of groceries, and you're looking, and you're surveying which line is the shortest, and you have like a formula in your mind, right? It's the number of people in the line times the amount of things in their cart, and you factor in the age and experience of the cashier. <laughs> you may have hurry sickness, but you definitely have hurry sickness if you take all of your kids and you say, spread out, everybody take a line, <laughs> and then just raise your hand. When you get there, and we'll bring the card over to you, right? You may have hurry sickness. You may have hurry sickness when it comes to bedtime. You know, reading stories with your little kids. And you walk and you're like, get the little book. <laughs> the skinny, no, that's too big. Get the skinny book. The one with a lot of pictures and very few words. You may have hurry sickness, but you definitely have hurry sickness if you take that skinny book with the big pictures and very few words, and you turn two pages at a time, hoping they don't see it, <laughs> just so you can be done. You may have hurry sickness. I am horrified to admit that all of these tactics have been employed by your senior pastor. So I am confessing my own battle throughout my life with hurry sickness. And I'm also confessing to you that this sickness has dire consequences. In his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, John Orberg writes about this. He says there's three main, just hugely horrible consequences to our hurry sickness. Number one, he says, is just the reality of clutter in your life, both material and otherwise. You know, when we're always in a hurry, lots of things get left undone. We've made a lot of commitments we can't keep. We carry around this guilt of, I said I was going to do it, but I didn't. And then we just have a lot of clutter in our car, in our house, everywhere. Things are just not getting done. There's so much clutter, and that clutter causes more stress and anxiety. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I can go look in your car, and I can find out. How many of you have hurry sickness? There's just a lot of clutter in our lives. Next is the consequence of superficiality. In our obsession with quantity, we sacrifice quality in every dimension of our life. In our obsession with quantity, we sacrifice quality in every dimension of our life. We may have reams of information, we lack wisdom. We have myriads of acquaintances, we lack one true friend. We are talking all the time. 
but our conversations and our interactions remain superficial as do most of our relationships. You know why? Because quality relationships, quality friendships, quality conversations require quality time. When we suffer from hurry sickness, we give very little quality time to anything or anybody. We have believed the lie that our value comes from doing more when in fact the quality of our time investment is actually in chronic decline. Number three, the third consequence is an inability to love. Orberg writes, the most serious sign of hurry sickness is a diminished capacity to love. Love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible. Love always takes time, and time is one thing hurried people don't have. There's actually a syndrome now. It's actually called the sunset fatigue. Anybody heard about this? Expert in the field, Lewis Grant writes, when we come home at the end of a day's work, those who need our love the most, those to whom we are most committed, end up getting the leftovers. Sunset fatigue is when we are just too tired or too drained or too preoccupied to love the people to whom we have made the deepest promises. Sunset fatigue is set in, says Grant, when you find yourself rushing even when there's no reason to. When there is an underlying tension that causes sharp words or quarrels. When you set up mock races that are really about your own need to get through the task, such as, let's see who can brush their teeth first, right? When you sense a loss of gratitude or wonder, when you indulge, listen, when you indulge in self-destructive escapes from fatigue, such as abusing alcohol, watching too much TV, you know, using porn, A myriad of other destructive things. Why? Because you need a little downtime. You need a little something for me. At the expense of the people that you're supposed to love. Because you're just too tired. It's called the sunset fatigue. It's a really big deal. A lot of people have this issue. Now, I have seen all of these consequences in my own life and my relationships with my family at seasons of my life. I'm going to tell you right now, hurry sickness is a real thing. It has real consequences. And I can tell you, for most of us, the most important goal that we could establish in our lives right now as you leave here and you walk out this door is to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. Think of hurry like a cancer. Hurry is not helping. Hurry is hurting. And now that I've said that, you're going to be like trying to get your kids out of the church. You're going to be trying to get them, you know, and you're going to be like, hurry. You know, like, oh. I, hope you, I hope that happens. I hope that you'll start be conscious of how many times you say, hurry. Hurry up. When, you, when you're saying that to yourself in your own spirit, it is not helping. It is hurting. Ruthlessly eliminate, eliminate hurry from our lives. Now, how are we going to do that? That leads me to my second point, which is living life on purpose. You know, when we study the life of Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who lived the perfect human life, all of our lives we want to conform to his life. When we study his life, uh, there's a few observations you can make. Number one, he was very productive with his time. Number two, uh, his life wasn't all that different from a lot of ours. He traveled a good bit. He was in high demand. He had very practical obligations that demanded his attention. He had a family who was eager to see him. He had significant friendships that he nurtured. Jesus had every reason to be a hurried man. Uh, But we never find Jesus in a hurry. He just never seems to be in a hurry, even when people want him to be. He's just not. The question, like, is how, how did he come to live this way? Well, what we find Every, every place in the Bible, when we see Jesus, he's living on purpose. He's living on his terms in a very, very uh, practical, purposeful way. He would start his day every morning. He would leave the, the many to find a place of solitude where he would begin his day in prayer. He found it necessary to spend time alone in solitude in prayer with the Father to get tuned into his agenda to cultivate that relationship. When Jesus went to work, he 
purposefully cultivated relationships with others in the process of his day. Hurried people tend to become increasingly isolated and non-relational. Jesus lived in such a way that he developed deep, abiding friendships. Why? Because Jesus prioritized people over productivity. Jesus had the grace to be willingly interrupted. In fact, if you go back, I challenge you to do this. Take any one of the Gospels. Go back and read the stories of Jesus you'll find that the majority of the stories of Jesus that we have in the Gospels are stories of Jesus being interrupted. Just think about it. Going through Jericho, there's Zacchaeus, right? You didn't even know that was going to happen. There he is. Let's go to your house. Just complete diversion from where he was going. The, the woman who, who grabbed his robe, right? Uh, the Canaanite woman. The, I mean, you can, go, you can go through and you'll just find story after story, the lepers, the blind men, most of the stories we have about Jesus are stories where he is willingly interrupted. Bonhoeffer talked about it this way. Jesus never allowed the it to trump the thou. Whatever his practical agenda was for the day, no matter the setting, Jesus did not allow whatever it was that he was intending to do to be so important that he dismissed the importance of seeing and serving the thou. First the father and the people that the Father placed on his path. And then we find that Jesus never wasted an opportunity in any setting to redirect people toward deeper eternal conversations, no matter how mundane the task. You know, we find uh, Jesus in John 4. He's exhausted. He's hungry. He's thirsty. The disciples leave him to, to go into town and get something to eat. A woman comes and she's drawing water. He doesn't just see an opportunity to get water. He sees an opportunity to go deep with this woman. It changes her life, changes her entire village and community. He was always on mission. So when we study Jesus, we find a life that was fully submitted to the will of the Father in all circumstances, and he practiced a rhythm of life. He practiced living this way every day. He lived on purpose. You know, once one of the reasons that Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, was so successful for many years was due to his insistence that everybody, all people, should begin to live their life on purpose. Don't let your life get swept into the have-tos and the ought-tos and all the crazy magic, but live on purpose. And he defined, biblically, five purposes in every human life. Worship, worship God, pursue the ministry God gave you, Pursue life in relationship and fellowship. Share the gospel in every opportunity you have. That's evangelism. And then teach people to obey Jesus. That's discipleship. He said these five purposes are woven into the life of every Christian. And if we would live our lives on purpose, constantly thinking of our purpose in every situation, whether we're at work, we're at play, we're at home, but live on purpose. These purposes really do ring true. If you study Jesus and his followers, wherever they were, whatever they were doing, whoever they were with, always living in the purpose of worship for God, service to others, sharing the hope and offer of salvation in the gospel, cultivating meaningful relationships, and teaching people to obey Jesus and to follow Jesus in the Jesus way of life as we find in the gospel. So when it comes to this stewardship of time, this discipline of time, we look to Jesus as the author and perfecter of our faith. We look how he lived in these rhythms. We look how he lived on purpose, how he trained his followers to live in purpose, not a manic lifestyle, but within these purposes that God has woven into us. And it's just a whole different way of living, isn't it? So that leads me to my third point, and that is some practical steps for how we might redeem our calendars and live our lives on purpose. These are very practical steps, but we're going to draw these from Scripture. All right, number one is what we saw with Jesus. There would be, be such a change in your life if you would practice solitude. One of the reasons that our lives are so out of control is because we have so many voices in our heads that demand our time, that demand our attention. I mean, it starts with our kids, our spouse, our bosses, our coworkers, our, our clients, you know, to the, to the kids as soccer coach, right? The kids' soccer coach and their uh, teachers and all of that. We have so many voices in our heads. By virtue of that phone that you carry in your pocket, 
Thousands of people have access to your attention every waking moment through a call, a text, or an email. But listen, nobody in history had more people calling for his time and attention than Jesus did. I don't know if you've read the Bible, but he had thousands of people following him all the time, constantly calling his name, constantly asking for his touch and his attention. So to avoid hurry sickness and to center his spirit, Jesus found it necessary to practice times of solitude. Mark 135, and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went to a desolate place and there he prayed. Let me tell you something. When you move to this place of solitude, and you're, and you're tuning into God and his agenda for your day, you were reminded that you have an audience of one. God is God, we answer to him. Our father trumps every other voice. His voice is ultimately the only voice that should have authority in our lives. Listen, here's the truth. If we are submitted to God and committed to his agenda for our day, everybody else in our relational world will be best served. You will never cheat your family. You will never cheat your job. You will never cheat all the things that matter if you are first in alignment and obedience to your Father in heaven. Everyone is best served if you do that. But, but what do we know? When you cheat God, when you cheat that primary relationship, everyone else actually suffers as a result of that, no matter how noble you think you are in terms of trying to accomplish so much in your day. Jesus focused uh, John 5, he says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This singular point of reference informed everything that Jesus said and did. Jesus used times and solitude in the morning to get honed in on the Father's will, and then he used the rest of the day to accomplish his will. We would do well to practice that same kind of rhythm in our lives. And then the, the second thing follows very closely to this. And this is this very high value in our church. If you've seen our core values, the number one core value in our church is to pray first. Pray first. Before you do everything, before you make any decision, before you make a purchase at the beginning of your day, and then pray all day long. In that spirit of prayer, we can tune our hearts to, to be in line with the peace of Christ. Look at Philippians 4, 5, and 6. The Lord is at hand. That's just a constant truth. Did you know that? The Lord is at hand all day long. Therefore, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God is our goal. How many of you know that? The peace of God is your goal in your life, in your day. Tomorrow, today, for the rest of the day, Make the peace of God your goal, and that will direct your steps. I'm going to tell you, uh, as a chronic hurry sickness person in my life, especially at stages in my life with four small kids and all of our craziness, I find that on those days that I will get up early and, and create time alone away from all the, the rush and get centered on the Lord, it is amazing how quickly my hurry sickness goes away, and it pretty much lasts the entire day. I mean, no matter how busy I am, as I pray, I can see God's hand and his provision and everything that's going on around me. I can be thankful. I, I can be thankful that I get to go to my next appointment. I can be excited about the fact that this is the day the Lord has made. That person on my calendar is somebody that God thought in advance. I can be thankful that I get to spend time with my kids versus being resentful that I have to play dad taxi yet again, right? It's all about your mindset. And your mindset begins to change. Your mind is being transformed because of the peace of the Lord that you get to do these things versus that you have to do these things. And it changes that whole hurry sickness into opportunities for Thanksgiving. But you must learn not only to begin your day that way, but all throughout the day, continue to stay in prayer. Keep that channel open with the Lord. Here's what Dallas Wilder writes. He says, prayer as a discipline has its greatest force in strengthening in spiritual life only as we learn to pray without ceasing. We can train ourselves to invoke God's presence in every action we perform. This is an experiential fact that has been proven in the lives of many disciples of Jesus, ancient and modern. Listen, God will meet us in love and love 
love will keep our minds directed toward him as the magnet pulls the needle of the compass. Habit will be confirmed in gracious interaction and our whole lives will be bathed in the presence of God. Constant prayer will only burden us as wings burden the bird in flight. Isn't that a beautiful quote? Such a beautiful picture. You think prayer is a burden. It is no more a burden than wings are to a bird in flight. If you want to rise above the manic mess of your life, it begins with prayer and seeking the Lord's presence, invoking his presence into everything that you're doing all day long. It will redeem your calendar. Number three, this gets really practical. Learn how to say no. Learn how to say no. As we study the life of Jesus, we find that Jesus had no problem saying no to those requests or offers that did not align with his mission. I would point you back to the temptation in the desert. And I'm going to point you to the second temptation as a case study. If you have your Bibles, you look in Luke 4. Uh, That's the whole story of the temptation there. But I'm going to look at Luke 4, verse 5. Here's what we find in the second temptation. And the devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I, give, I will give all this authority and all their glory, for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Now let me ask you a question. Does that language sound familiar to you? It should. Because what we just read is the temptation of promotion. It is the satanic temptation of more. More power, more money, more influence, more financial security, more prestige, more respect, more freedom to do whatever you want, more glory, more recognition. Oh, sure, there's a cost but it's going to be worth it when we get more. You see, many of us are suffering from hurry sickness because knowingly or unknowingly, we said yes to the temptation of more. When that promotion was dangled in front of us, when we walked into the store and we saw the promotion for that new product, when the opportunity came along to make a little bit more money, even though we had to bend the rules, we chose to set our faith and our family and our friends on the back burner. And in so doing, we agreed to worship, give ultimate worth to the God of more rather than the Lord our God. And friends, let me tell you something. I want you to listen now. God will never bless your worship of more. You can ask him to, but he's not going to. God will never bless your worship of more. If your hurry sickness is due to your obsession with more, the cure will most certainly involve saying no to the God of more. And here's how Jesus responded to that temptation. He says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. Every one of the temptations was answered with three words. It is written. What would happen if we began to filter every request for our time, every advertisement, every potential purchase, every promotion through the word of God. I suspect it would give us the perspective and the power to say no to so many things that clutter our calendar and drain us of our energy, just dominate our lives. Number four, prioritize what matters most. Prioritize what matters most. I know many of us are stressed. We're constantly talking about how busy we are and how little margin we have in our lives. And you know what's funny? is we, we say that with kind of like a little badge of courage. How are you doing? Oh, I'm so busy. Man, the kids are doing this. I'm working 60 hours a week. And, and somehow in our weird Western mind, you kind of think people are going to admire you because you're so busy. But Jesus said this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the rest will be given to you. Prioritize. There are some things in your life as a Christian 
that must come first. Prioritize. So how do you spend your time? How do you prioritize your time? Did you know that every person on the planet gets exactly 168 hours a week? No exceptions. You can't get any more. You can't get any less. You get 168 hours a week. And I'm going to tell you that every one of those hours is a gift. We didn't earn that hour. We can't determine whether we get more or less hours. We're not guaranteed any more hours, ever. We're not even guaranteed another day. Every hour that you get is a gift from God. And the way you choose to invest that gift is, God's, is, is your gift to God, right? I mean, that, that's your spiritual act of worship. So how do you think that our Lord and our creator would have us spend the hours that he has gifted to us? Do you think that you are spending the gift of your hours in a way that honors God and brings hope to the world? Let me ask you a question. If Jesus walked into your home and hung out with you just as kind of an observer over the next week, do you think he would give you any counsel about the way you might want to change your habits of time management. Let me just give you a few sobering statistics. This is just basic internet research. You can do this yourself. The average American spends four hours a day, that is 28 hours a week, which is one-fourth of his waking hours watching television. The average American spends 11 hours a day, 77 hours a week, 69% of his waking hours watching, reading, listening to, or simply interacting with the media. The average American adult spends over three and a half hours a day, 24 and a half hours a week, just looking at his phone. Our kids, aged from 8 to 18, spend an average of seven hours a day, 49 hours a week, staring at screens, which is just less than 50% of their waking hours. But according to Barner Research, the average Christian prays one minute a day. The average pastor prays five minutes a day. So we spend one minute in prayer and three and a half hours looking at our phone. We spend one minute in prayer and about an average of maybe 20 minutes a day talking to our spouse and even less time talking and playing with our kids. But we have... 11 hours a day to be reading, watching, and engaging with the media. Let me ask you a question. Are we really that busy? Or are we wasting the precious gift of time that God has entrusted to us on those things that are admittedly not all that important at the expense of those people we deem the most important? I know that hurts your feelings, but we need to agree that there's a problem before we'll ever be motivated to address the problem. We need to prioritize our time because we're not going to get it back. Every day is a gift. Every day is an opportunity to invest in relationships that are going to last for eternity. Every day you have a choice to make. As Dan Mears, the Kansas City Wolf, said yesterday, you can rise and whine or you can rise and shine. You can spend your day or you can invest your day. Here's what the scripture says. The Apostle Paul, so brilliant, from his letter to the church in Ephesus, he says, walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time. This is a discipline of our faith. And it probably hits us where it hurts the most. Time is our greatest capital. But I'm going to challenge you, church, to practice the faithful stewardship of time. To get started, let us just... Just remember, first, commit yourself as you leave here today to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your lives. 
prioritize people over productivity. Let, let us begin every day with time alone with God, and most importantly, let us pray first and pray without ceasing. Will you pray with me? Lord, this one hits very close to home for all of us. Give us eternal perspective that you have given us this gift of time. It is precious. It is fleeting. Lord, the, the enemy of our soul has created so many distractions. We're so motivated by entertainment. We, we actually welcome distraction rather than investing in the people and the kingdom opportunities that you've placed before us. Help us to see every moment as a God-ordained moment, as an opportunity to give thanks, as an opportunity to invest, as an opportunity to just relish the people that you put on our path, even when they're difficult, even when these are hard times, that we would see this as an opportunity to invest these precious hours that you've given to us. Lord, I pray that you would remove the anxiety in our spirit. So many of us carry so much anxiety. It leads us to depression. It leads us to hopelessness. So we pray that you would reorder our lives around the rhythm of Jesus, that we would seek you early, that we would find our center and our peace in you, and that we would invoke your presence into everything that happens throughout the day, that we would be those birds that take flight with the wings of prayer. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.